In 2014, there were a series of network-wide strikes on the London Underground. Many commuters rushing to their jobs in the city had to explore an alternative route. For a fraction, the alternative they chose was more cost-efficient and quicker at getting them into work. After the strike, some people stopped using the London Underground because they had found a better option, something they would probably never have explored without being forced to. Insufficient exploration of one's surroundings is at the root of many real-life problems. It can create and reinforce biases, for example, only choosing options determined by the status quo. It can leave us in a state of inertia and learned helplessness. It takes courage to explore because failure is a possibility. And yet, studies have shown exploration may have a positive effect on a person's mindset. People on expeditions often have higher levels of responsibility taking, decreased cautiousness, and greater sociability. You might find something useful to yourself or others. If you don't, well, perhaps the journey helped you grow and develop. When I was a child, I listened on repeat to an audiobook of The Great Explorers by David Angus. From Ibn Battuta to Neil Armstrong, I loved the sense of being on an expedition into the unknown, with a clear purpose to find and discover something new. However, the majority of David Angus's great explorers came from a particular time in history, and a particular location. From the 15th to the 17th centuries, European maritime explorers mapped out the far reaches of the globe. In the 18th and 19th centuries, they ventured further inland to fully explore the American and African continents. Although Chinese expeditions to Africa are well known, the enduring image of the explorer in Western culture comes from the Victorian period. A man in a pith helmet, headgear that comes from the Philippines, dressed in khaki, a Persian word, and sporting a pronounced beard or moustache. This is the image of the explorer. Today, the age of discovery is under revision. Explorers preceded violence, plague, and oppression. David Angus's heroes have become villains. But can we still learn something from them? And what do their actions tell us about the dark side of our own curiosity? Path seldom trod. Mansfield Parkins loved to travel. He left Cambridge without graduating and went to visit Constantinople. He then spent the next nine years on the road, eventually ending up in Egypt. Here he was taken by the idea of trying to find the source of the White Nile, a snaking river running through the deserts and savannah of the Sudan, before becoming lost in an impenetrable swamp. En route, Parkins stopped to explore the ancient kingdom of Abyssinia, which today we call Ethiopia. From 1843 to 1846, he travelled in Abyssinia, including a year spent working as a local silversmith. To better understand the people, he took to walking barefooted, adopted local dress, and even had his hair done in the Abyssinian style. He kept a diary and made drawings of his experiences, which he later published as a book. Life in Abyssinia details both Parkin's adventures and the culture, environment and customs of the people he met. On its publication, his book was greeted with interest and tolerance for his unusual behaviour. One reviewer stated that, We accept the book and are grateful for it. With the author's tastes depraved, though we cannot but consider them, we purpose not to meddle. Parker's plan to go native made him a sort of gentleman savage. His behaviour had placed him in the category of the eccentric in English society. But what had motivated him to take this course? People rarely become eccentrics, and even fewer eccentrics gave up the prospect of a degree at Cambridge to spend three years living in Abyssinia. Parkins began his travels shortly after the death of his mother. He had personal reasons for his decision. Whilst in Egypt, he planned to travel south to find the source of the Nile. 
the search for the source of the Nile was the great geographical mystery of the age. One approach to the psychology of curiosity, the curiosity drive hypothesis, suggests curiosity is a sensation we have when there is something ambiguous or uncertain. What's behind that locked door? Who were they talking to on the phone? Where is the source of this enormous river we call the Nile? Parkin's motivations in Egypt certainly fit into this theory. There was something unknown about the River Nile. He wanted to resolve that ambiguity. But he was quickly seduced by Abyssinia on the way. He was so taken with what he found there, and it satisfied his curiosity so completely that he lived there for three years. The birds and animals are meticulously detailed. The customs, beliefs, and manners of the people are presented with enthusiasm and care. Here, he had found something that truly satiated his curiosity. This was not a quest to uncover a mystery, but a free and open exploration of whatever he encountered. His behavior in Abyssinia aligns more closely with an approach to the psychology of curiosity, known as optimal arousal. This is quite a different idea to that of the curiosity drive. Instead of being an attempt to resolve a painful uncertainty, optimal arousal suggests there is a preferred level of mystery and novelty for the mind. If things are too repetitive, they become boring. If they're too stimulating, they become overpowering. When the level of arousal in our minds is just right, it can be quite pleasurable. So in Abyssinia, Parkins found that optimal level of arousal for his mind perfect balance of newness, strangeness, and familiarity. On his return from Africa, he reflected on how his thinking had changed. England has customs which, to a native like myself, who has the power of closing an English mind's eye and opening a foreigner's one whenever he pleases, appear as wonderful and unaccountable as any that I have described or that could be found among the most barbarous nations of the world. Apart from a brief appointment to the British Embassy in Constantinople, Parkins rarely travelled abroad after his return to England, but he was able to maintain the optimal arousal he had had in Abyssinia by playing games in his mind, imagining his own country and its customs through the mind of an imaginary Abyssinian. He had returned to his country a changed man with a new identity. He was worried in parts of his book he appeared only half an Englishman, but it was a trade-off he was willing to make for the optimal arousal of his own curiosity. Second-hand, without sacrificing their own identity, the reader could achieve a similar kind of pleasure. In a way, stories of people who seemed so different solidify the English reader's sense of identity, for it is often against others that people choose to define themselves. Abyssinia was mentally arousing, Abyssinia gave Parkins a unique identity, Abyssinia helped people decide what it meant to be English. There were many rewards to Parkin's curiosity. In 1887, almost half a century after Parkin's left for Abyssinia, the journalist and explorer Henry Morton Stanley prepared an expedition which was designed to be a final crowning achievement to his career. The culture of exploration had changed dramatically since Parkin's day. Stanley was an international superstar who was on personal terms with kings and prime ministers. Expeditions in Africa were media sensations modelled on the key idea of individual achievement in the name of a social good with commercial backing. The main goal of Stanley's expedition was to rescue Emin Pasha, the Ottoman imperial administrator for the most southerly province of the Sudan, called Equatoria. Emin Pasha had been cut off by the Mahdi uprising and was now threatened by the rebels. But there were many other interests at work. Stanley had secretly agreed to help make treaties with local chiefs for the British Empire. He was in contact with the Belgian King Leopold 
who insisted he use the Congo River steamers as part of the expedition. He claimed to also be combating the slave trade, exploring new territory, trading ivory, and there was also a book to be written about the whole adventure when it was over. At least some of that book had probably been written by Stanley before the expedition even began. The expedition started in Cairo and then travelled by boat to Zanzibar, where they picked up several hundred African porters. The quickest route would then have been to go inland from Zanzibar. But Stanley had other plans. They continued by boat around the Cape and up to the Congo, where they boarded Leopold's steamers. By this point, the expedition consisted of over 700 people, not including any camp followers. Stanley's force was carrying over 500 rifles and a Maxim machine gun. The expedition is non-military. Its purpose is not to fight, destroy or waste. Its purpose is to save, to relieve distress, to carry comfort. The expedition is a mere powerful caravan, armed with rifles for the purpose of ensuring the safe conduct of the ammunition to Emin Pasha and for the more certain protection of his people during the retreat home. For many of the Africans who encountered the expedition, Stanley's powerful caravan looked more like one of the many roving slaver bands from the coast than something sent to relieve their distress. After reaching the furthest point their steamers could go, Stanley divided his forces with half the men to stay with the rear column at a base in Yambuya and the other half, the advance column, to travel through the Ituri rainforest towards Lake Elbert, where they were to meet with Emin Pasha. The journey through the forest was a disaster. 150 members of the advanced column died on the way. The lack of food for such a large group forced Stanley to trade weapons with local slave traders. In turn, he was beset by groups of forest people who understandably saw the militarized mobile village as a threat. When they finally arrived in Lake Elbert, Emin Pasha was nowhere to be found. It would be another four months' delay before he travelled down to meet them. Stanley and his force were low on food and in rags. Emin Pasha, who appeared to be doing fine, gave them some supplies. He was grateful for the ammunition, which he needed to keep fighting the Mahdi. But he was holding his own and didn't actually want to be rescued. A standoff ensured, with Stanley refusing to leave until Emin Pasha agreed to come with him. Stanley decided to return to the rear column. It was now almost a year since he had left them in Yambuya, and things were in disarray. The Europeans left in charge had become notorious for their brutal behaviour. Some had been killed in disputes, others were seriously ill. Many of the Zanzibar porters had died. Stanley returned to Lake Elbert with the remains of the rear column, to find Emin Pasha's troops had mutinied. Emin gathered his remaining loyal men and set off with Stanley's now unified expedition to the east coast. On the way, Stanley met with local chiefs, who he charmed into signing treaties, granting their territories to the British Empire. At a banquet held in their honour on reaching the coast, Emin fell out of a window and cracked his skull. He stayed in Africa to recover, while Stanley left for Cairo. Fifty days after arriving in Egypt, he had produced a 900-page book, In Darkest Africa, which naturally made him the hero of the story. Other expedition members wrote their own accounts, which they used to attack and blame him. Reputations were tarnished, books were sold. Although the expedition mapped out new places and encountered new cultures, curiosity is perhaps not the first word that comes to mind when hearing about Stanley's behaviour. He was extremely ambitious, and his attitude towards the people he met was often exploitative. Many studies have been conducted on exploration versus exploitation in animal behaviour, often asking why animals choose to explore new options or exploit known ones. But often the two behaviours are connected and even happening at the same time. A hawk may keep an eye out for rabbits while scavenging a carcass. Stanley might explore a new route from Equatoria to the coast, whilst transporting 75 tonnes of ivory to be sold in Zanzibar. Animals and humans also adjust their exploration and exploitation depending on what others are doing. Rainbow trout, for example, 
exhibit more risk-taking behavior towards new objects when other trout are doing the same. One study has shown how humans who heard others had benefited in a game were more likely to exploit new discoveries whilst they played. The actions of the members of the Emin Pasha relief expedition fit well into these patterns of behavior. The expedition took place in the late 1880s during the scramble for Africa. It was a chaotic mess of ambitious exploration and exploitation. Six, a few days from the town of Zinda in modern Niger, a Dutch traveller found two graves under a tree, shaded from the oppressive heat. They belonged to Paul Voulet and Julien Chanoine, two French army officers who perhaps deserve to be the most notorious expedition leaders in modern African history. In 1898, ten years after Stanley's attempt to rescue Emin Pasha, Voulet and Chanoine petitioned their government to allow them to march into the interior of French West Africa and claim Lake Chad for the empire. They were given instructions to explore the area between the Niger River and Lake Chad and place it under French protection. Both men had bloodthirsty reputations among their fellow officers, and while still in French territory, the column of 2,000 soldiers and porters began looting villages, killing their inhabitants. One of the French officers protested about the violence to Voulet and was sent back to Dakar. He wrote a long letter to his fiancée about what he had witnessed. She passed this on to a contact in government, and soon the French minister for the colonies was looking for a way to recall the expedition. There was concern the expedition's orgy of violence would cross over into British colonial territory and foment a diplomatic incident. Colonel Jean-Francois Clob was sent after them from Timbuktu with a small group of 50 men with orders to take control and send Voulet back to France. After giving chase for 2,000 kilometers, passing through the devastation left by the expedition, he finally caught up with Voulet's column outside the town of Zinda. Voulet threatened Klob if he came any closer, he would order his men to open fire. But Klob advanced towards him, convinced that the soldiers would respect his rank and obey his orders. Voulet instructed his soldiers to fire, and Klob was killed. That evening, Voulet told the other French officers what had happened. He took off his braided uniform and told them, I am no longer a Frenchman, I am a black chief and with you I will found an empire. But being a chief did not mean one could do whatever they wanted. There were as many rules and customs associated with chieftainship as there were with being a French army officer. It was by his Frenchness, not his Africanness, that Voulet had justified his behavior. Once the West African soldiers heard about what had happened, they began planning a mutiny. When an informant told Chanoine what had happened, Voulet shot the man for warning them too late. He assembled the troops and began threatening them and firing at them. They shot back and Chanoine was killed. Voulet escaped but was shot by a sentry the next day when trying to get back into camp. Perhaps the strangest part of the story is that the expedition somehow managed to achieve its aims. The remnants of Klob's and Voulet's groups came together and reached the shores of Lake Chad. As a result, the remaining French officers avoided court-martial, and two of them went on to become generals. Voulet and Chanoin have been described as psychopaths by one historian. Although their mission had been to explore territory, the behavior of the expedition members quickly descended into a cycle of looting, killing, and burning. Their prejudiced attitudes certainly contributed to their actions. The French government claimed they were driven mad by the heat, but perhaps another approach to the psychology of curiosity can offer a perspective. Cognitive consistency theory argues that when two cognitive structures, ways of seeing and viewing the world, are logically inconsistent, 
then this stimulates a strong response in the mind. When we encounter very large inconsistencies, this can lead to a fight-flight response. In this model, when people experience curiosity beyond the optimal level of arousal, they may become an aggressor. Voulet and Chanwan had a learned response to difference, to make a desert and call it peace. Their curiosity drive was connected to violence and aggression. To explore was not just to exploit, but also to eradicate inconsistency. Voulet's desperate decision to change sides and declare himself an African chief appears less strange now. It didn't matter if the French won or the Africans. What mattered was the aggressive destruction of one side. When Hergé published Tintin's most embarrassing adventure, To the Congo, in 1931, the image of the explorer had already become a tired parody of itself. Tintin, the journalist, shoots some animals, educates some Africans, stops some bad guys, and leaves a hero. It sounds like one of Stanley's books, and it's interesting to imagine what he would have thought of the children's cartoon. The African explorer gradually faded out of popularity, and their contradictory selfish motivations were exposed. But the 19th century explorers do have something to offer us beyond condemnation. Our curiosity is affected by personality, place and wider society. It can make us uncomfortable and drive us to resolve a mystery. It can also give us immense pleasure in the right quantity. Being curious can offer people new ways of identifying themselves and others. Curiosity and the decision to explore is rarely far removed from the desire to exploit. It can become a mixed up mess of motivations. In the worst cases, it can be used to justify aggression or violence. There is a dark side to curiosity, but it's also something we need to move forwards, overcome bias, and grow and develop. In a world where we are rapidly exploring artificial intelligence, genetic engineering, and space, people sometimes question the decision to explore something without a guaranteed return. There is always a risk that the mission will fail, and we will not reach our goal. But looking at 19th century exploration, one might respond that mission failure is surely the least of our worries. Thank you, listener, whoever you may be, for watching this video. If you'd like to watch more videos like this, please like and subscribe to the channel. I wish you a calm and peaceful day.